The power of God is manifested in the beating of the heart, in the action of the lungs, and in the living currents that circulate through the thousand different channels of the body. We are indebted to him for every moment of existence and for all the comforts of life. The powers and abilities that elevate man above the lower creation are the endowment of the creator. He loads us with his benefits. We are indebted to him for the food we eat, the water we drink, the clothes we wear, the air we breathe. Without his special providence, the air would be filled with pestilence and poison. He is a bountiful benefactor and preserver. The sun which shines upon the earth and glorifies all nature, the weird solemn radiance of the moon, the glories of the firmament spangled with brilliant stars, the showers that refresh the land and cause vegetation to flourish, the precious things of nature in all their varied richness, the lofty trees, the shrubs and plants, the waving green, the blue sky, the green earth, the changes of day and night, the renewing seasons all speak to man of his creator's love. He has linked us to himself by all these tokens in heaven and in earth. He watches over us with more tenderness than does a mother over an afflicted child. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pity of them that fear him. Councils on Stewardship, page 17, paragraphs 1 to 4. God is good. And all the time. Yeah, I love that passage so much. And it also goes on to page 18, paragraph 1, but I won't bother you with that. But we are indebted to God. We live, some people, not you, live life as if they have no connection to God. If you are alive, you're connected to God, whether you're a saint or a sinner, because all life comes from God. But I believe I've told you before, you cannot do this without God. You cannot swallow without God. I, we are, we're just absolutely, you know, Ellen White makes a statement, He's caring for us every moment. He keeps the living machinery in action. If we were left to run it for one moment, we would die. We are absolutely dependent upon God. And so I have uh, developed a habit. I have gotten older, I've developed a habit. If I walk up the stairs from my basement, I don't know if you have basements, basements in Virginia, but we have basements in Michigan. I thank God I can walk up the stairs. This is no joke. I thank him I can walk up the stairs. I don't like winters at all because you know why you have to shovel snow. But I literally shovel snow this way. And God is listening to me. Father, I thank you for the strength mm -hmm, to shovel snow. That's how I shovel snow. I prefer to shovel snow than to be lying on a hospital bed. Uh, you're not listening to me. <laughs> you know how blessed you are to see? I am told that perhaps the second or the third most widely spoken language in the United States is a sign language. Because so many of God's children are hearing impaired. But you can hear me. Thank God. Thank God. Don't take anything for granted. Thank God. You can think clearly and you're not in a mental institution. Thank God you're not in a drug rehabilitation program. Thank God. Ah, God gets so little recognition for all the good that he does for us. Every day, moment by moment. I love God and I like him. It's 12 minutes after six. I want to get into the message, which is lessons from the garden. What did I say? 
Is there anyone with us tonight for the very first time? May I see your hand? First time. Ah, we have a daughter of God. We have two daughters of God. Would you kindly tell us your name? Is what? Parish. Parish. Parish, as in the parish. All right, where are you from, Sister Parish? South Carolina. Who invited you? Your mother. Oh, well, God bless you, Parish. Thanks for coming. I mean that from my heart. Say amen for Parish. Amen. Is that two R's or one, Sister Parish? One. All right. Louisiana has parishes. All of the states have counties. All right. Yes, my lovely sister. What's your name? Michelle. Who? Michelle. Michelle. Are you friends with Michelle Obama? <laughs> no? Okay. How are you, Michelle? Nice to see you. Where are you from? Philadelphia, yes, but you're now 20 years, that's long, it's a long time. Who invited you, Michelle? Who invited you? Ah, all right, okay. Thank you very much for coming. May the Lord place his hand upon you. May the Lord place his hand upon you, not his hand of judgment, but his hand of mercy. Can you say amen? amen. And provide your needs. May the Lord protect you. May the Lord keep you from the COVID-19 virus. May the Lord bless your families. And above all, may the Lord save you in his kingdom when he comes. And I'm not joking, I'm quite serious. We hope you can come back tomorrow. We end on Sabbath, which most people call Saturday. Anybody else, first time? My good brother, blessings of God. Anybody else, first time? All right. How was your day? Did you behave nicely? Some of you had to pray for this. <laughs> you behave yourself nicely today, under all circumstances. <laughs> okay. Oh, <laughs> we have an honest angel to the left. She says she behaved badly for five minutes and that was it. But the Lord still loves her with all his heart and soul. All right. It's nice to see you. Let me tell you, I'm very honored each time I stand at this desk to speak to you about God's word. My honor has two levels. One, to speak for God. And two, to speak to those whom God loves and whom I believe loves God. And so thank you for this sweet privilege. It will end very quickly in two days, but I shall long remember it. But let me not speak as though this is the last night. I just wanted to let you know I have been honored to stand before you and deliver the words of life. I'm always happy to see you, my dear sister, and those of you who you sit in certain places and you never move. So it's... <laughs> You know, sometimes, when I was a Catholic in my early years, the church I attended, there were names on the pews. And you couldn't sit there. If the person didn't come to church that Sunday, it remained empty. There were names, little nameplates. This is Sister Brown and Sister Blue and Sister Black. You could not sit there. Are you with me? So they, that, I, I look at you, you... You don't change the geographical locations at all. I do the same thing in my local church. My wife and I sit one place. I tried sitting on the other side of the church and I felt I was in a different church. No, I really did. I felt I was in a different church. It felt strange. I needed GPS to get to the other side. And so I never sat there again. I, it's amazing how we get accustomed to one thing. When you try to move us out, it feels strange. That's why some churches never do anything new. Because it's... <laughs> Somebody said, oh, 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 it feels so strange. Ah, but for the sinner, the gospel is strange. Can you say amen? amen. But we need it for our lives. Thanks for coming. Uh, do three favors for me. Let me make sure my phone is off. I believe it is. Yes, okay. The disciples didn't have these, and they took the gospel to all over the world. We have all kinds of things. We can't do anything. Anyway, make sure these things don't ring in the presence of a holy God, please. God loves reverence. And when we show him reverence, he responds by blessing us. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And I really want to speak the words of God. They are life. Jesus said, 
in John 6, 63, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. He did not say that about my words. Favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us reason together. I mean, really apply your mind and think. What's our subject? Lessons from the garden. What garden do you think that is? The Garden of Eden, that's right. Let's pray. Dear God, we've come to you every evening this week. But Father, we come as though it's the first time. We don't come as a routine, dear God. We come as a need and a joy. Look upon us with favor, with mercy, for the sake of Christ, and also because you love us, because you sent him. If we've offended you, dear God, forgive us. Sometimes we do it not really wanting to hurt you. We do it. Forgive us, God. And as you remove that sin, grant us power to avoid that area of offense. Give us more hatred for sin and a deep, deep love for righteousness. We thank you, dear God, for our guests. Bless them, Sister Michelle and Sister Parrish. Bless their lives. Bless our regular visitors, dear God. We thank you for every person in this building. We thank you for your sons and daughters connecting online. Bless them as you bless us. Now, Father, speak through me, dear God. Let my great joy be to present, thus saith the Lord, and keep my opinions to myself. Father, someone listening to me in person or online may have contracted the coronavirus. I'm asking you, God, not commanding you, just asking, appealing, pleading. Heal that person, Father, because you're a good God. Whether the person comes to church or not, heal the person because your word says he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. Let the sunshine of your healing favor rest upon them and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Let the raindrops of your mercy heal them, dear God. And remind us what a merciful God you are. If there's services like this anywhere else going on in this conference, this union, this division, this world, Bless the speakers and bless the audience. Now, Father, take all the glory, but give us the blessing we pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Go with me to Genesis chapter 2. Our subject, Lessons from the Garden, 20 minutes after 6. The reason why I always check the time, I don't like to keep people long. And it doesn't take God long to bless people. The Sermon on the Mount, if you read it, Matthew 5, 6, 7, that doesn't take 45 minutes, as sometimes I've taken, or 50, or an hour and a half. But it's the most powerful sermon you can read. Matthew, not Matthew, Genesis chapter 2, we read verse 9. When you found it, say amen. amen. All right. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay, what does that verse tell you? God made the trees to grow out of the ground. He identifies two trees. Name them. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There are only three trees identified by name in the first three chapters of Genesis. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life, and the fig tree. The fig tree, those three by name. All right, let's go to Genesis 3. Let's read from verse 1. Our subject, Lessons from the Garden. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Okay. What do you learn about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil from verse 3. It was in the midst of what? The garden. 
Go back to verse 9 of chapter 2, read it quietly, and then tell me what you learn about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Read it quietly. Don't guess. Read it quietly. Genesis 2, 9. Now, what can you tell me about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It was also in the midst of the garden. Are you following me? What's our subject? Lessons from the garden. Not the garden of Gethsemane. The garden of Eden. But let's learn something about this garden. Genesis 2. Let's read verse 7. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. And we read 8. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Now read verse 8 with me. And the Lord God planted the garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, what does verse 8 tell you? God made a garden. It was east of Eden. Okay, he formed man in 8, in 7. Made the garden in 8. What else does 8 tell you? He made a garden, yes. Where? Eastward in Eden. What else happened in that verse? He put the man there. What does that tell you? Give me the relationship between a man and a garden. It's his home. It's his home. Now listen again to verse 8 microscopically. Read and listen microscopically. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. So all of Eden was not the garden. Ah, you're not with me. Are you following me? All of Eden was not the garden. The garden was placed in Eden. So we had the garden as one small area. Then we have Eden. Then we have the rest of the world. The tree of life was not just anywhere. It was in the garden. Tell me about the garden. It's the man's home. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, verse 3 of chapter 3, tells us the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was where? In the midst of the garden. The issues that are important in life are not on the edges of your life. Are you following me? Matters of life and death are right in the middle of the garden of your life because they are important. You may eat from this. Leave this one alone. Both in the midst of the garden. When that woman sinned, she was at home. Ah, you missed it. <laughs> Problems in the church can be traced back to the homes. Problems in society can be traced back to the homes. A disruptive child in a classroom can be traced back to the home. Life and death in the midst of the garden. What's our subject? Lessons from the garden. That which matters is not on the edges of our lives. They are right in front of us. Choices, right and wrong, is always right in front of us. And every day, we have to make choices. Every day, now we can avoid the wrong and focus on the right. Let's look at another lesson from the garden. But let me pray first. Father, as I continue, remind me I'm speaking for you. And to those whom you love, let that guide the spirit with which I speak. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's look at Genesis 2 verse 9 again. 
and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, also the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, look again at verse 9. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's what? Pleasant to the sight. Come on, and good for food. Stop. Now, it shows how God cares for us and our health. Tell me two things about the tree. They were pleasant to the eye. And then they were also good for food. In other words, food should look good. Ah, you're not with me. Don't bring me something, even though it's good for me, but it looks like a, 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 a plate of mud. Nicely seasoned mud. I don't want it. Are you with me? It doesn't look good. Look at those restaurants when they put up pictures of the hamburgers and the fish sandwiches and the pork sandwiches and the lizard sandwiches. They're beautifully photographed. Beautifully photographed to attract your attention. This trace is, is traced back to God. God arranged that food should look good because it aids the digestion. Are you with me? And so God made trays that were pleasant to the sight and good for food. But you can take a good thing too far. Go to chapter 3. Let's read verse 6, our subject, Lessons from the Garden. It's 6.30 already. Do you have verse 6 of chapter 3? And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was what? Pleasant to the eyes. Mm -hmm. You can take a good thing too far. You know, men, we have to walk around society. We have to go down to the store. We have to go to the bank. We go to the gym. And there are some things that we see that may be pleasant to the eye. Men, you're following me? Do I need to be blunt? You're following me. But we can't take that too far. I was in the gym today. And sometimes you have to keep your eye on the machine. <laughs> ah, you're not with me. You have to keep your eye on the machine. You get off the machine, and as you puff and bath, you wait for your next bench press set, you recite uh, Revelation 15. <laughs> Which I do. Mm. Because some things are too pleasant to the eyes. One of the problems the woman had, that she took the beauty too far. If it's that beautiful, it must be good. No, beauty and goodness don't always go together. Are you following me? Sin is always, is frequently very attractive. You see, the devil, he packages sins very beautifully. Many, many years ago, I read, I'm sure I read it, there was a move, I don't know how serious the move was, to put cigarettes in black and white boxes in Canada, I think it was. Many years ago before you were born. There was an uproar. Because the manufacturers argued, who wants to buy a pack of cigarettes in a black and white box? For those of you who fly, and the Lord allows me to fly quite often, before this COVID problem, there were magazines in the seat back pocket. You know what I'm talking about? Those of you who fly. You take up those magazines, each airline has its own magazine, and at the back of the magazines where you find all the alcohol and the cigarettes, which you can buy on the plane. Are you with me? You go shopping 38,000 feet in the air. You look at those bottles that contain alcohol. Beautiful bottles. I mean nicely shaped. You look as though that's what you'll drink in heaven. Are you following me? This are Artistic creations, but what do they contain? Cirrhosis of the liver. You look at a box of Virginia Slims. Are you with me? And the woman on there. She looks like an angel looking for the wings that she lost. But what does that box contain? Cancer of the lungs. The devil took sin and he packaged it this God said. In verse 16 of chapter 2, in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's what God said. The devil said in verse 5, God doth know. In the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He took sin, and he packaged it so beautifully. 
He presented sin as a way of life. When God said it was the way of death, the devil functions like that. There are people right now in drug rehabilitation program, the second, third, fourth one, trying to break drug habits, cigarette habits, alcohol, whatever it is. Now, people know that, but still people go because it looks so attractive. It's the cool thing to do. You look at all the movie stars and they take a drink. Whatever you see on TV, when people are distressed on television, they run straight for drink. They never go for a Bible. They go for two things, a drink or cigarette. And so sin looks attractive. But God's word must guide us through a world of beautiful sin. Fornication can be made very attractive because the stars do it. The celebrities do it. They dress half naked. Well, I can dress half naked because they make it attractive. But what guides our thinking must be, thus saith the Lord. The Lord said, don't eat it. Lessons from the garden, not everything that looks good is good. Are you following me? Come on, say amen again. Not everything that looks good is good. Fattening food is always sweet. The things that are worse for you are always the sweetest. Who likes broccoli? Are you following me? Nobody likes, but it's good for you. What have we learned from the garden? One, the issues of life are right in front of us. Choose right or choose wrong, it's up to you. Now, another lesson to learn. Let me pray. Father, as I continue speaking to your people, speak to me first that I may speak to them what you've said to me. In the name of your son, I pray. Amen. Listen to God in Genesis 2, 16, 17. Go there with me. You're already you're in Genesis, I believe, already. Chapter 2, 16, 17 is a familiar passage. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And then God stepped back and left the choice to Adam and Eve. Listen to me. God will never decide for you. You have to decide in the light of the knowledge that God has given to you and me, knowing that whatever God tells me is for my good, even though I cannot see. My mother died November 2018. Let's put God in a class all by himself. Are you with me? On a human level, anything good in me I trace to my mother. Notice I said God is in a class by himself. But at a human level, anything good in me, I owe to my mother. And there's something I never told her in life, and I regret it. She's passed on. I wanted to tell her, Mom, now I'm a man, I can tell you, everything you ever told me when I was a child, you were right. But I would fuss. I'm 15. How can my mother be righter than me? I'm 15 because my friends told me this is what I should do. Not my mother who pays my bills, puts a house over my head, a roof, buys my clothes, pays my tuition, buys my shoes. You know, not, not her. My friends who get me into trouble, they're right. But I wanted to tell I never told her, Mom, everything you ever told me, you were right. Now that's God. Anything God tells you, is for your good, but you may not see it. That's why we have to trust him. Now, question. Can you trust someone who says, let there be light, and the light just comes? Hmm? Can you trust someone who says, let there be fruit trees, and they spring right out of the ground? Can you trust that person? Yes. And so God said, Adam and Eve, when he spoke to Adam first, Eve had not yet been made. You see that tree? Leave it alone. Everything else, yours. Now, it's up to you. Choose. God leaves you and me to choose. Lesson from the garden. God will not come down and take that pack of cigarettes out of your pocket. He will not take that condom out of your wallet. 
He gives us wisdom, information, and then the guidance of the Spirit. And we can feel the Spirit telling us, don't do that. But arrogance leads us to do exactly what tells us, God tells us not to do. Lessons from the garden, the issues of life are right in the middle of our lives. We can't avoid them. Right and wrong, right and wrong. Another lesson, God does not shield us from all the, the, the possibility of sin. He doesn't. He provides power to avoid it. He does not shield us because the devil has a right to test us. You've gone to class for six months studying math. You must have an exam. That's a test. What have you learned? How have you developed? Let's look at another lesson from the garden. Verse 9, chapter 2. And out of the ground may the Lord God to grow every tree, tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, also the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We talked about that. Food must look good. God is interested in what you eat. Ah, that amen was a little weak. Let me say it again. God is concerned about what you eat. Let me show you something. Go to Genesis 2. Let's read verse 19 and 20. Are you there? Verse 19, read with me. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now, let's stop right there at the end of 19. Name some animals for me quickly. This side. A what? A bird. A what? A lion. A bear, a giraffe, a dog, a cat, hippopotamus, rhinoceros. Hmm? Name a bird. Eagle. An eagle. Then there's a hummingbird. Then there's an owl. You, a chicken. All these animals God brought to Adam. Hmm? The Bible says, the last part of verse 19 of Genesis 2, whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was a name. What lesson is that for us? Now, was that before sin or after sin? Before sin. When your mind is at one with God, your choices are God's choices. Ah, you didn't follow. One person followed. When your mind is one with God through constant surrender, your choices are God's choices because it is God working on your mind. And so Adam named the animal God. He didn't change one name. And so the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If you and I function with the mind of Christ, we will make the decisions Christ would make. He didn't change a name. Here, came, here comes one animal, long. Adam looked at it and said, eh, a crocodile. And God was standing under a tree. And God smiled. And the angels were there with him, the angels. <laughs> then here come an animal with a neck that taller than this church. <laughs> and Adam said, giraffe. And God and the angel. And one angel said to another, he must miss one. Every animal. Adam gave a name. And God didn't miss one. Now, Go to chapter 3. Let me show you something else. Now, listen to me carefully. Naming someone is a way of establishing a relationship in the Bible. So Adam was acting like God by naming the animals. Genesis 3. No, not 3, sorry, 2. Let's go in 2. We read 21 to 23. And uh, let me pray. Father, continue to be with me, please. In the name of Jesus, I appeal to you. Amen. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Question for you. Who named that person woman? Adam gave her that name. And God was standing right there. But God let him choose the name. 
God was standing right there. God let him choose all the names for the animals. Go to chapter 3. Let's read verse 20. Yeah, cha verse 20, chapter 3. Our subject, Lessons from the Garden. Read with me. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So how many times did Adam name Eve? Twice. God was there. Let him do it. In other words, <laughs> before Adam sinned, he named the woman, he called her woman. God had no problem. After Adam sinned, now he's come back in repentance. He chooses the name again. God doesn't change it. He calls it Eve. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, go back there now. Let's see if God lets Adam choose. Are you there? And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, add to that verse 29 of chapter 1. We'll add verse 29 of chapter 1 to verse 9 of chapter 2. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. Who chose the diet, Adam or God? God. Now, couldn't God leave Adam to choose? No. Who chose the names for the animals? Adam. Who chose the names for Eve? Adam. Who chose the diet? God. Now, what does that tell you about diet in the eyes of God? Diet is a matter of life and death. And I mean physically and spiritually. You can eat your way to hell. You know, we live in a society where most dinners take place in restaurants. Even though research has shown that families who eat together, the children do better at school. Ah, you're not listening to me. You don't like me anymore. <laughs> Listen to me. Research has demonstrated children who eat fam at family dinners at home do better at school academically. Restaurants have pulled families out of the homes. And they don't serve what pleases God. Listen to me. Diet is a matter of salvation. The very first temptation of Christ was on diet. Where did Adam fall? On diet. Which means in the work of redemption, the first work of Christ is control of appetite associated with diet. Lessons from the garden, diet is important to God. And it's 13 minutes to 7. Let's look at another lesson from the garden. Let's go to Genesis 2. We'll read 21 to 23. I hope someone has already said, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. I don't think you realize how serious I am when I ask you to do that. I'm very serious. Are you at Genesis 2, 21, 23? And the Lord God caused the deep sleep. No, no, let's read 18 first. 18 first. Are you there? Read with me. And the Lord God said what? It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. God is interested in your social life. Are you with me? He is interested in you having a social support system. People with a social support system live longer than isolated people. Studies have shown that. One of the reasons why older women live younger, uh, longer than older men, older women tend to, they, they reach out to each other. Older men tend to be isolated. The experts have studied it. And so the women live longer than the men. If a husband dies, the woman is more likely to live much, uh, a long, many more years than if the woman dies, then the man shrivels up and dies. Because women are much more likely to have a social support system. Listen to God. It is not good that a man should be alone. God cares about your social life. Then God has a girlfriend for you somewhere. Uh, come on, I thought you'd say amen. 
uh, tell me how much you like me, but you didn't. <laughs> God has a partner for you somewhere if he, need, if he wants you married. Because he said originally, I don't like people being isolated. It's not good. By the way, if you can come to church, come. It's not good to stay at home even if the service is online. If you can come, come. And fellowship. Now let's go to verse 21 of chapter 2. Our subject, Lessons from the Garden. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. God cares about your romantic life and your social life. Lesson from the garden. Commit your social and your romantic life to God. He will direct it to your eternal blessing. Run it yourself and you run aground like a ship on the seashore. Let God direct your social, your romantic life. Because he wants you happy. But sin has corrupted our understanding of happiness. For us, happiness is let me get what I want. When the mind is purified, happiness is what pleases God. Let's learn another lesson from the garden. Let's go to chapter 3. We read verse 7. We read 6, 7, and 21. It's 10 to 7. Do you have chapter 3? We read from verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now verse 7. You haven't read with me all night. Read 7 with me. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. This is the first thing the Bible records that created human beings ever made. I didn't say that clearly. Let me say it again. The very first thing a human being ever made, as far as the Bible records, is the apron of leaves. Which was to cover where? The outside. Which was to beautify where? The outside. Because you cannot beautify the inside. Are you following me? So we spend a lot of time beautifying the outside. But where does God look? On the inside. So after they had made these leaves, these designer aprons that they made. Here comes God in verse 21. Read 21 with me now, nice and loud and clear. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Stop. Let's look at lesson one, then lesson two from that experience. Lesson one. Go back to verse seven. Now. Look at the word apron in verse 7. Is it singular or plural? Are you sure? There's an S at the end. What does that tell you? How many aprons were made? Two. Why? There were two people. Mm -hmm. We sin individually. Don't blame your husband for your sins. Don't blame your wife for your sins. You chose to sin because you're not six months old. We choose individually to sin. Let's go to chapter 3. Listen, for we read 9 to 10. Chapter 3 of Genesis 9 to 10. Are you there? Yes. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, read it for me now. I heard thy voice in the garden. Come on. And I was afraid. Come on. Because I was naked. Come on. And I hid myself five times. Eve didn't hide him, he hid himself. Now who hid Eve? She hid herself. Sin is an individual matter that has social consequences. An apron for her and an apron for him. That's the way the judgment works. Now, go to verse 21. Lessons from the garden. Come on, read with me. Genesis 3, 21. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them now. Look at the word coat. Is it singular or plural? Look at skin, singular or plural? Okay. Why? 
There are two people. Salvation, come on, finish my words, is an individual matter. You don't say, well, Lord, I'll get baptized when my wife is converted. Mm -mm. It's not the wife calling, it's the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit calls you, all other voices have to be silenced. Salvation is an individual choice. Sin is an individual choice. Go to Genesis 6. Let's look at the conditions just before the flood came from God. Genesis 6. Are you there? Yes. Let me pray. Father, as I continue in the last part of this message, continue to be with me, please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's read uh, verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Okay? The fact that the verse begins with a but tells us the, the passage before that is different from Noah's life. In other words, read verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's the way people were in the days of Noah. Now in verse 8 we hear, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Keep reading. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now read 11 and 12 carefully. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. It sounds like a social activity. Read verse 12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. Now finish it. All flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Mm -hmm. Individual sins creating social chaos. We go back to verse 21 of Genesis 3. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, God deals with us individually first. I want to get that through to you. Did the Lord God make coats of skins? And now, let's look at another lesson from the garden. Go back to verse 7 of chapter 3. I want you to identify the material used and the style of clothing. Come on. What's the material? Leaves. What's the style of clothing? An apron. Was God pleased with that, yes or no? No. Then does God have an idea in his mind what a Christian should look like when the person dresses? Yes. Now go to verse 21. Is there a different material used, yes or no? What's the material? Is there a different model of clothing used? What is it? A coat. Now, who is more covered? Someone in an apron or someone in a coat? What is God trying to tell his people? When you dress, finish my words, cover yourself. You skimpy stuff, you know. Cover yourself. Why are you showing off something that's sinful? Cover yourself. Lesson from the garden, God likes his people well covered when they dress. Because a sinner has nothing to show off to the world. You didn't hear me. A sinner has nothing to show off to the world. God changed the fabric and he changed the style. And many of us, men and women... But mostly the ladies, ladies don't get mad, don't call the police. Mostly the ladies need to change the way they dress in God's house. When you come to God's house, you should not look as if you're going to a, a party or the mall. Lessons from the garden. Three minutes to seven. Let's pray and I'll ask you some questions. Father, I'm coming to the end. Continue to let your spirit be with me and with my brothers and sisters, your people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This side, one lesson from the garden. Raise your hand, I'll recognize you. Yes. Something had to die and trees don't die. Trees don't give blood. Something had to die, yeah, shed blood. Without shedding of blood is no remission. Lesson from the garden. God cares about what we eat. So you may have to change what you plan to eat tonight. All right. Lessons from the garden. Yes, Dr. Drake. God cares about our social life. He really does. 
Lessons from the garden. God leaves you to choose. He gives you information and he leaves you to choose. Yes. When you name something, you create a bond. That's why God named every star. Adam, who was given dominion, he named every animal. Lessons from the garden. Yes. Believe what God tells you, even if it goes contrary to what you see. Believe God. As I said before a few nights ago, if the Bible says this is white, even though you see black, what must you say? White. Why? Because God said so. God told Noah, rain is coming. Rain had never fallen. But it did come. One more. Lessons from the garden. Yes. Say that again. You are responsible for your sins. Stop blaming the pastor because you don't understand the Bible. You can go study it yourself. Are you following me? You can pray and ask the Spirit of God to teach you. Yes, sister. You're responsible for your own sins and your own attitude. You're not short-tempered because your wife cooks spicy food. You're short-tempered because you won't do anything about it. Lesson from the garden. God cares about what we wear. He really, listen to me, diet and dress are spiritual issues. When God told Moses to make clothes for Aaron, in Exodus 28, verse 2, the Bible says, Thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron for glory and for beauty. We choose for beauty first. So we can look better than anybody else. God told Moses, make them for glory, reflect God, and for beauty. God is not shabby. I want you to decide in your own mind, your own heart, which of these lessons from the garden applies to you. You don't have to tell me. And then talk to God about it. Do I need to change my diet because God is concerned? Yes. Do I need to change the way I pursue my romantic life? Yes. Do I need to change the way I dress? Yes. Do I need whatever? If any lesson applies to you, talk to God. You know why? He loves you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he loves you right where you sit. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I give you one minute to talk to God that I pray. Amen. Before I pray, let me say this to you. Who is the creator? <clears throat> yes, God is a generally correct answer, but be more specific. Who actually? Jesus Christ. Who put coats on Adam and Eve? Jesus Christ. Who killed the animal from which the skins were taken? Adam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who decided what they should eat? Jesus Christ. Who came down to fix the problem of sin? Jesus Christ. I'm trying to tell you, it is Jesus who's concerned about how we eat, how we dress, our social relationship. It is Jesus. Representing the Godhead. It is Jesus who sheds a tear outside the restaurant when he sees what we choose. It is Jesus who stands outside of Macy's or whatever, Nordstrom's, and watch the dresses and whatever we buy. It is Jesus who watches our romantic behavior and sheds a tear. It is Jesus who told Moses, make garments for Aaron that reflect my glory. And that, of course, that's beautiful because God is the God of beauty. It is Jesus. You heard my voice, of course. 
But the message came from whom? Jesus. Jesus wants you to be careful how you eat, how you dress, your social life. Jesus wants you to understand the choices in life are up to you, but he gives us wisdom to make the right choices. Jesus wants us to understand we are individually responsible for our sins, our choices, and Jesus also wants you and me to understand we come to the judgment one by one. You do not go to the judgment as a family. One by one. We see this in the garden. God came down. He spoke to Adam first. Then he spoke to Eve. Then he spoke to the serpent. When he handed out punishment, he punished the serpent first. Then Eve. He didn't do it as a group. He could have said, oh, if you come, come, come. Curse. Mm -mm. One by one. You remember the families, you're all members of families. God will judge the family one by one. I ask you again as your brother, if any of the lessons from the garden applies to you, talk to God about it. Let's stand. Before I pray, in the spirit of personal choice and personal judgment, if you've been convicted to make a decision for Christ, make that decision individually. Not that you don't care about your family, but you realize your first responsibility is to God. Whether that conviction is to be baptized, rebaptized, whatever it may be, make the decision with the power and the help of God's Holy Spirit. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, we thank you for the lessons from the garden, and there's so many other lessons we could have learned. We thank you, God, for being so patient, so long-suffering, Father. We know you hate sin, but you love us so much that sometimes we confuse your love for us, and we call it love for sin, but you do not like sin, because look at what sin led to your son to suffer. Dear God, where, if, where we have failed you in diet, forgive us. Where we have failed you in dress, forgive us, God. Where we have failed you in our social relationship, forgive us. Where we have failed you in individual responsibility, forgive us, dear God. And as Jesus was on that cross by himself, because the disciples ran away, and you yourself forsake him for a while, he was on that cross by himself. Help us to understand, Father, we have to make individual choices. Bless your sons and your daughters. They love you, Father, and I love you too. Give us strength and power. Help us to trust you, dear God, because you made us to have someone to love. And you know the thoughts you have towards us, Father, thoughts of peace, not of evil. As we travel tonight, let an angel take all of us home safely and watch over us tonight as we sleep. Dear God, let us do everything in our power to come back tomorrow to hear the words of God. And if the devil tries to erect barriers, tear them down and let us come. If there's anyone living alone, give the person the consciousness that you are the unseen partner in that home. Thank you for your love. Bless those who listen online, dear God. Thank you for your love. Watch over us tonight, I pray. I pray this from my heart. In the name of the powerful Jesus, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. We're going to be singing number, uh, hymn number 213, Jesus is Coming Again.
I gave the benediction, I'd like to ask again, are there any special prayer requests? I want to offer a special prayer. Any, yes, sister, tell us. Say it again. Joanna. Anyone else? Special? Yes. Sister Wilson. Sister Wilson. Okay. Family. Say that, Dre. Family. Family. Children. Children. Friends and family. Family and? Oh, grandchildren, family. Okay. Steve. He's sick. All right. Friends too. Friends too, yes, Brother Drake. Yes, my brother. Provision, yes. Your grandson. What's his name? Isaiah. Good Bible name. Yes, sister. Grandsons. Grandsons. All right. Say it again. Oh, nieces and nephews. Okay, okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Yes. Your children and Sister McDaniel. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. All right. I t yes. You and your family. All right. I'll kneel. Anyone who wants to kneel, please do so. I won't be long, but I want to offer this special prayer. Father in heaven, you know exactly what we need, but you love when we come to you. If we did not have needs, Father, we might not come. And you allow certain circumstances, Lord, to bring us to you. And so we come. As always, Father, if there's sin in our lives, forgive us, dear God. You love to forgive. Forgive us. We have burdens, we have concerns, and so many of the requests, dear God, we're for family members, friends, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, I'm sure cousins, spouses, brothers, sisters, dear God. Some of us are ill, we're sick, some of us in pain. And Father, you look down, you see all these concerns we have. There's some who would love to see family members come to Christ, or classmates come to Jesus, or someone being harassed on the job, or someone supervises not well. Whatever it is, dear God, you told Abraham in Genesis 18, 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is no. The angel Gabriel told Mary in Luke 137, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Jesus himself, your son, equal with you, he told his disciples in Luke 1827, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Father, demonstrate that divine possibility, dear God, and help each person who expressed a request, a concern. Enter into this circumstances, Father, and help them, dear God, because without you, we have nowhere else to turn. And so I ask you to be merciful, Father. Touch the sick. Provide for those who have needs. Meet their needs, dear God. Bring back the lost. Save those who've never come to you, Father. Unite broken families, dear God. Rebuke sin and suffering, Father. And let us have some reason to say hallelujah. Hear this humble prayer, Father. We demand nothing. We command nothing. We just plead with you, knowing that you are only hope. Hear this humble prayer to God. And answer us quickly, Father, because that's the way we are. We want quick responses. As quickly as you can, answer us. Now watch over us tonight. Thanks for life. Bring us back tomorrow, Father. Change our characters. Change our attitudes. Give us the sweetness of Jesus. And save us when you come. In his name we pray. Let God's people say amen and amen. God bless you. Please keep the speed limit as you travel tonight. Because we have to obey God, we also have to obey the laws of the land. Please don't pray to God for traveling mercies and then speed. It makes no sense. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow, the Lord willing. God bless you. God bless you. Elder, God bless you. Dr. Dre. Yes, yes, yes.